Just a little bit about myself, where I'm coming from before this presentation. Uh, as you can see uh, from the screen, I've uh, spent uh, 19 plus years of my life uh, as the uh, primary uh, software developer for the computational engines in InFlood Modeler Pro. Uh, during those intervening uh, years, I've also been involved in um, developing models for flood forecasting, also implementing uh, models uh, for flood flood forecasting so they're ready to get into the flood forecasting system and also over the last uh, 12 months or so I've spent uh, two days a week on secondment at the Environment Agency uh, actually um, integrating uh, flood forecasting models uh, in, into their uh, flood forecasting system, the uh, NFFS. So I'm, I'm coming in, in it from uh, a, a wide area, I guess, not the full 360 degree view. For instance, I've never been a, a flood duty officer, but I, I, I do approach this from, uh, uh, from a few angles. So just to uh, give you some of the, uh, a, an overview of uh, what I'll be talking about today, um, after a general overview, I'll be talking about specifics of a, a flood forecasting model as uh, differentiated from a, uh, from a, say, a strategic model. I'll give you some tips and tricks uh, of what you can do to those models and, and what makes uh, those characteristics unique of a flood forecasting model. And I'm going to talk a bit about my experience over the last year and integrating models into a flood forecasting system and uh, give a few tips on, on where I think that, that us as uh, model developers and reviewers uh, can look for things or, or can improve things. And then I'll give a, a quick overview of, of what the future may hold for uh, flood forecasting. So I guess the first thing to say uh, after the uh, gratuitous pictures of, of some flooding is, is the role that flood forecasting and flood forecasting models play in flood forecasting. So the, uh, I guess the primary purpose is to produce results that inform the end user uh, and able to uh, take decisions, whether that decision is maybe to, um, to deploy temporary defenses or to issue uh, warnings to the public, uh, maybe in, in severe cases to e evacuate or to implement emergency plans or, or just to uh, operate a, um, a gate of, uh, of a barrier, for instance. Um, and the, these pictures actually come from the recent flooding in the last week in Wales and Cornwall. And as you can see here, we have this uh, bus that is having a bit of trick, a bit of bit of difficulty um, uh, get going down this road. And then maybe with with some advance warning, then we can uh, potentially advise that driver to stay at home that day, or maybe to take a different route. So these are a kind of decisions that we, that we can take, which are informed by our, our flood forecasting models. And just to give you a, a, a a degree of uncertainty within the flood forecast models. I've just uh, extracted this piece of text from a news article and I highlighted some of the words that, that basically mean uh, possibly, probably, and that's just kind of like highlighting the uncertainty. So there's a lot of uncertainty in flood forecasting, but how can we make that better? If we can get our models to run quicker, if we can get them to run more, more accurately, then that's going to improve our forecasts. Okay. Okay, so uh, again, um, let's describe what happened last week in Cornwall. A bit of a um, bit of an extreme situation, being a flash flood. But uh, within 40 minutes after the first rainfall was uh, was observed in, in in the village of Coverack, 40 minutes after that, then there was actually reports of flooding. So that kind of highlights the the importance of uh, making. Uh, timely flood warnings to get to get the models to run really quick so we can um, we can um, take take the decisions or we can in, inform the public or whatever we need to do with our um, uh, w with our results um, excuse me I'll just uh, go on to the next slide um, so thankfully in, in the UK last week there were no reports of any casualties unfortunately this isn't always the case and there's also last week across the pond in Arizona, uh, there was a, a, a flood that led to the deaths of, of nine people in the same family. So quite a tragic, very tragic incident that. So that's just to highlight that uh, the flood forecasting and the flood warnings that are issued can actually be a, a uh, matter of, uh, of uh, life and death. 
Um, so to talk a bit about where Flood Modeler is used for flood forecasting, well, it does form the, um, the major component of fluvial uh, modeling uh, within, uh, within the constituent nations of Great Britain, that's England, uh, Wales, and Scotland. And it's also used in the flood forecasting system in the uh, lower Mekong Basin covering four countries, that's uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, and uh, Cambodia. So that's an overview of where flood model is used for, for flood forecasting. I'm going to talk a bit more about um, conversion of existing models for use in flood forecasting. So there are a lot of existing models out there. I'm going to give you a few tips and a few ideas of how we, how we move from, say, a strategic model to a flood forecasting model. So the first thing we need to consider is the extents of our model. Um, do we need to reduce the extents only to cover the areas that we're interested in, or do we need to extend it to uh, cover more of an area? Uh, we need to know where our forecasting points are, so our model needs to obviously cover our forecasting points. Um, our gauging sites are useful not only in uh, evaluating how good our forecasts are, but they often uh, verify and provide the inputs to our flood forecasting models. Uh, we need to concentrate on what are the mechanisms for controlling the floods and the water levels so that there may be some critical structures or cross sections which are uh, controlling the, uh, uh, controlling the uh, water surface elevations and also um, where, where are our inflows or inputs to our models coming from. Generally they come from telemetry at uh, gauging stations but it can also come from say an upstream, uh, upstream rainfall runoff or other hydraulic model or maybe from a, a coastal model if we're uh, applying a tidal downstream at the downstream end. Um, so some features are of a uh, forecast model that make them quite different from a strategic model or a mapping model is the, uh, the purpose is the prediction of water levels and we run those with up to uh, 120 hours as warning. So our forecasts generally go up as far as five days so we can give a prediction of water levels with, with approximately five days warning. Um, for a mapping model we're generally interested in where the, where the flooding has occurred so we need to know the water levels and the, uh, and the depths at uh, every location without the model Whereas for a forecast model, we're generally looking at a discrete number of points. So it's just water levels and flows at a small number of points. Um, but rather than just a, a design event or a calibration event, our uh, forecast models need to run 24-7. They need to run all the time, so for low flows and for high flows as well. For a strategic model, we don't particularly care, we do care a bit, but we don't, we're not really that bothered if it runs in hours or days, but a forecast model needs to run it in a timely fashion. Uh, we need to run them in minutes, maybe even seconds. And there's a difference in boundary data, so we're getting real-time data into our forecast models, not design data, so it's real-time data, whether that's real-time observed data from telemetry or our forecast, uh, our forecast um, flows from an upstream either hydraulic or a rainfall runoff model. And of course, a uh, flood mapping model usually uh, contains a 2D uh, component with it, whereas our uh, forecasting models need to run very quickly, typically will not uh, contain a 2D element to them. So how do we go about doing this? Well, the primary objective is to uh, reduce the run time. Um, so they need to be quick but also stable. So generally we need a longer time step and we can use the adaptive time step to increase your time step. Uh, we simplify the model so we reduce the number of nodes and we reduce the number of calculations. So we might have a, um, a minimum distance step. Uh, and with these, with these techniques we can achieve maybe 10, maybe 100 times speed up over your mapping model. Uh, so areas in which we need to improve stability are typically in spills, uh, lateral spills in steep channels where models often have uh, difficulty running. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And then in structures when we've got movable gates that are uh, opening and closing all the time. Uh, we can simplify those and we can smooth those out. Uh, we need to consider the uh, floodplain mechanisms so we can simplify the floodplains. As I said earlier, if we, uh, we'll need to uh, remove the 2D component of the model and model it in purely 1D. We um, need to consider if there's, it, does the uh, floodplain, uh, the water going on the floodplain actually influence a downstream area of interest? If not, then do we need to spend that much detail in, in modeling it? 
uh, reducing the number of units and the complexity within those units. So for instance, if we have a hydrological boundary or an inflow, we can maybe reduce that into a single boundary and distribute the flow laterally across the model. Similarly, with a spill unit, the more survey points are in a spill unit, the more calculations the software has to, has to do. And is it really giving you that much information? So cut down your uh, the number of uh, data points in a spill unit to, to only those uh, critical high and low, low um, elevations that, that, are, uh, that are influencing the flood. So it's important we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, but we do uh, need to remove any cross sections that are neither aid stability or have any influence on the, on the results. So that's removing uh, non-critical sections uh, that aren't really having an, uh, an influence either on the uh, robustness of the model or, or the final results. And a flood forecast model needs to run from a, a range of initial conditions. We're effectively doing a continuous simulation. So we're, we're starting from, uh, not starting from scratch every day, we're, we're continuing where we left off yesterday, say if we're doing a, um, um, if we're restarting a run for the next day's forecast. Uh, so there's a few things on um, converting models. Now to talk about things that, that are reasonably unique to a flood forecast model. Not, not totally unique, uh, but uh, quite specific to flood forecasting. So earlier I mentioned about uh, steep models often have a problem with the uh, in fully hydrodynamic model models, but we can use the uh, routing sections to get over that. So we have four Muskingum routing units. So these work on the storage equations. They calculate discharges, but not necessarily water levels. They're a mechanism of, of uh, routing flow from upstream to a downstream location. We have four Muskingum units. So we've got two parameterized ones, the, uh, the standard KX method and the VPMC, the variable parameter Muskingum Kunj method. And then there are two that are based more on cross section. So we have the XSEC unit, which is based on a full cross section, and then we have the routing section unit, the RSEC unit, which is based on an idealized uh, cross section. And these can be combined with a fully hydrodynamic model, so we can have an upstream uh, steep reach, which is modeled by a routing section, and the downstream reach is modeled by a fully hydrodynamic section, as in the uh, diagram that you can see now. So we have routing for the upstream uh, tributaries and main channel, and then it flows into a fully hydrodynamic reach downstream. Alternatively, you can have a routing only model, and then that might pass as an inflow into a downstream model as well. So there are a number of ways you can do that. And some of the advantages and, and uh, disadvantages of, of routing models are displayed on screen. I'll just pick out a, a couple of them. Uh, one of the advantages is that uh, you don't actually need a, a surveyed cross-section. We can just run them with, with, uh, with parameters. And they do run very quickly. They are very low on computing requirements because they don't have always have the cross-section information. Uh, pick out one of the disadvantages, and I think I'll turn that into a, an advantage. About halfway down, the third one down, so it's usually more successful on steeper channels where no backwater influence on flow. Okay, so it doesn't calculate the backwater, so it's not very good on, um, on, on the flatter channels, but I will say that it is often a lot better than the fully, uh, fully hydrodynamic uh, sections, especially in terms of stability on the steeper channels. So quite often we will use the uh, the routing sections in the uh, steeper upstream uh, catchments. Uh, another feature uh, that is uh, specific to um, to flood forecasting models is updating. So updating is where we adjust the internal parameters of a model uh, to fit actual observed data. So we can improve our model by pulling in some observed data. So we can do this whether it's on a reservoir level or a uh, river level or even the discharge in a river. river. But primarily it's used in upstream uh, reservoirs where, they, uh, where the water levels in the, um, in the reservoir do have a, a critical effect on, on the flow downstream. So we apply a, a, an observed time series so that when we're starting our simulation, we are starting our model with the best available of data. So we use observed data as opposed to uh, model data. And some of the uh, parameters that uh, you might want to consider, or you probably should actually consider when uh, developing a uh, flood forecast model, and some of these are pulled from the, uh, uh, from there's a few guidance documents knocking around. Um, 
One is the hot start functionality. So this is where Flood Modeler does not perform any additional time steps at time zero. Effectively, you're running into the simulation. You're picking up from where you left off. And because we're doing a, effectively, we're doing a continuous simulation, but we're restarting every day or every three hours or whatever it is, then what we really want to do is to pick up from exactly where we left off. So it gives the same results as if you ran a complete simulation all the way through. Um, then our tolerance parameters, we can relax them slightly to uh, ensure our model runs stably. Um, so, for instance, our flow tolerance, the default is 0 0.01, so we can maybe increase that to, say, uh, 0 0.05. Probably no more than 0 0.05, but there is a bit of degree of freedom in there. Similarly, HTOL, the head tolerance, uh, we can also re relax slightly. But because primarily we're work, walking on working on water levels, we don't want to tweak that too much. So relax it a bit, but probably not above 0 0.02. Again, the default for that is 0 0.01. Um, if our model is using uh, the global Priceman slot uh, to overcome problems in low flows, that's less desirable than maybe going into the individual sections where it is a problem. Okay, so. Uh, manually put a Priceman slot in as opposed to uh, using the global option. And then the adaptive time step, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if we tick the adaptive time step option, then it runs at a, a higher time step and therefore quicker when it's able to, and it runs at a lower time step when it's having uh, uh, stability issues. So it's the best of both worlds, so it should help your model run uh, more stably, but also more quickly when it can. Okay, so those are some of the specifics about a model. Just talk about um, how flood model models fit uh, within a forecasting system. So to give you a summary, we start off uh, with our rainfall data, uh, which can be our observed rainfall data from telemetry, um, or it could be a forecast rainfall data. We run that through a rainfall runoff model, so a PDM model, to generate an, an outflow. And then it's that outflow that we use as our boundary condition for our flood modeler. Our flood forecasting model. So our flood modeler routes the uh, routes the flows downstream, calculates water levels and flows at our uh, specific points, and then that returns the uh, flow and level forecast uh, back to our, um, our our flood forecasting system. And then we can use those to uh, inform the user uh, to uh, whether he needs to issue a warning or operate a gate or, or whatever. Um, what makes Flood Modeler um, a, a good tool to use within a forecasting system? Well, for a start, uh, we have an inbuilt uh, adapter uh, that enables it to, um, to link with the uh, Delft Fuse, very popular forecasting system. Um, there's an export facility within, uh, within Flood Modeler that enables you to create those files that enable it to, uh, to, to talk to Delft Fuse. And even if we use a, another forecasting system, the open uh, data formats of Flood Modeler make it easy for, for anyone to develop their own flood forecasting system, where they use the, uh, the, the, the Fuse adapter as a stepping stone to convert it into a specific format, or where they want to write their own, their own programs to convert the data. Uh, and these are the, uh, the, the uh, screens that enable us to uh, export to uh, to Fuse. So if en essentially we select our input locations, so that these will be our flows and maybe our um, downstream boundaries if we've got a tidal boundary. And we select our nodes that we want our forecast uh, to be read at, and then we click on the export to Fuse configuration, and that creates our Fuse compatible input files. Um, so a summary of the system processes, so we need to assemble our input data, where that's observed data, or forecast data, or a combination of the two. We run the simulation, and we process the results, and that's usually used in conjunction with other models, so we might have an upstream rainfall runoff or another hydraulic model upstream, or we might need to run a coastal model uh, to generate our tidal boundary. So again, in summary, how the fuse adapter works, uh, it exports the, um, the input data in its own format. The adapter converts that data into Flood Modeler input format. The adapter runs Flood Modeler, 
and then it runs a third phase which converts its own native uh, data format into fuse compatible uh, data format and then the forecasting system then can read that data back into it. So to go over some of the requirements of our um, of our forecasting system, they need to be timely, uh, they need to be accurate where we want them. So as I said, we only need to produce um, results at key locations rather than the whole of the model. But also they need to be robust. They need to run all the time for whatever inflows you uh, it, it, you want to throw at them. And uh, okay, so the primary purpose is to be able to generate um, generate warning info or info that will lead to uh, producing flood warnings in a timely manner. However, they also need to run robustly all of the time. They need to run 24-7. We're running them with whatever inflows uh, we need to give them. And if our model doesn't run at inflows, at low, in, low inflows or low flow conditions, it costs to recover from uh, a failure, whether that's uh, whether the forecasting system itself needs to be fixed or the model may even need to go back to consultant and you as the developer may need to fix it as well. And also when we do have an event, because it's a continuous simulation, it's helpful if we uh, start from the, uh, from the uh, right initial conditions for our best possible forecast. So if we've been running our uh, simulation uh, at low flows and it's been running, running well, then at least we know when an event does come along, we're actually starting from the right place. And th these are some of the things that I have experienced in, 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 in o over the last year or so. So um, what I would advise is that we do need to set some minimum flow conditions. So we're not particularly care bothered if the model is very accurate at low flows. We're more concerned that it does need to run at low flows. So set some minimum flow conditions and communicate those uh, flow conditions to, uh, to the end user as well. Um, you need to supply default initial conditions. If a model does fail, then it needs to restart uh, from a set of default initial conditions. That's what we call a cold start. And typically, they will be at the minimum flows. They don't have to be, but usually the minimum flows and the cold start default initial conditions file are, are at the same flows. And then the model needs to be tested. So it needs to not only to be tested for a um, uh, for flood events that we're expecting, which obviously is its primary purpose, but we need to make sure that the model does run at base flow conditions, at everyday uh, conditions, to make sure that it will um, that, that it will always run. But it also needs to re recover from default initial conditions. And ramping up of flows in that case is allowed, so it can you can say give it 10 hours to warm up from your default initial conditions to your to your flood initial condition, but it always needs to be able to recover. From so those are some of the advice that I'll give for those of you developing and supplying flood forecasting models. Okay, just to wrap up with um, a few things about the future of flood forecasting. Uh, there's been a lot of recent interest over the, over the recent years in 2D modeling, and I think uh, there will be more interest in the future in 2D models, where that is due to uh, the uh, increased uh, performance of computers, the parallelization of models, or may even simplified uh, hydraulics as well, and we're involved in a project at the moment which is investigating the uh, uh, the effectiveness of our um, fast our flood, flood modeler fast uh, solver uh, for flood forecasts, and so that uh, performs reduced hydraulics but uh, runs very quickly. Um, there's also probabilistic forecasting. Um, we do get a um, ensemble forecast for our for our search for our tidal conditions. I believe there is also available or soon to be available uh, ensemble rainfall forecast. So we can run our um, rainfall runoff models for a uh, for a number of possibilities, and that gives us some uh, quantification of the uncertainty in our forecast. And that's something that our new product, uh, Flood Cloud, would be uh, very is is. Is, is quite geared towards is running multiple simulations at the same time. And then there's the, I guess what you say, the more everyday improvements that we are making to Flood Modeler and the, and the forecast and adapter. And one of those is, is the integration with 2D models. So we can enable, enable it to pull in and export results from 2D, uh, from 2D models. And also one of the new features uh, that will be 
coming in the next release in 4.4 of Flood Modeler is that the boundary units and the structure units will be able to, you'll be able to specify real times and dates within that. And that makes it very easy to import um, observed, uh, observed data in so we can, uh, so we can not only calibrate but also um, use observed, um, observed real time data. So um, that's what I need to say. I've gone a couple of minutes over, I know. Uh, so in summary, uh, flood modeler and flood modeler model hydraulic models is uh, one of many processes which make a flood forecasting system. So there are real-time observations and uh, rainfall runoff uh, models, uh, coastal models. Um, it's used to inform crucial decision it's in real time so it must run quickly but also give accurate enough results and the flood forecasting is evolving so i talked on the previous slide about where we might go and it continues to grow in sophistication and flood model will be at the uh, at the heart of that too